بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Brothers and sisters, I would like to welcome you to the first of our classes of the explanation of the Kitab al-Tawheed by Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab on this 7th day of June in, 19, in the year 1999, corresponding to the 22nd of Safar, 1420 of the Hijra. And I would like to first and foremost congratulate you for choosing this type of experience for opting to undergo an intensive series of Islamic lectures and courses insha'Allah for the next two or three uh, weeks and I say that insha'Allah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you with sincerity and reward you with good in this life and the hereafter and may he make this series of lectures a means of barakah, a means of good for us in this life so that we can worship Allah upon a basira, upon a clear light, upon a clear vision and so that we may then attain the fruits of this worship in the hereafter by obtaining Jannah insha'Allah. And I would like to point out that this book, Kitab al-Tawheed, in my opinion, is, is one of the most um, practical and beneficial books to study in our time. And that the author, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he compiled in this book a series or a, a group of Quranic ayat and a hadith that are related to each other, all concerning the topic of Tawheed, which we'll talk about in a short while. Now the author... Uh, his full name is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab ibn Sulaiman from the tribe of Wuhaybi. And he was born in the year 1115 of the Hijrah. Right now we're in the year 1420. He was born 1115 of the Hijrah, which is around 300 or so years ago. And he was born in the uh, city of Dar'iya in Saudi Arabia. Well, at that time it was called, uh, called Arabia. It wasn't called Saudi Arabia. Um, and he lived a life of knowledge in the sense that his father and his grandfather and his tribe was well known for knowledge. So he memorized the Quran when he was young and he studied under many of the famous uh, shuyukhs or the scholars of his time. Um, however, he noticed that in his countries, in Arabia of his time, there was a lot of shirk, there was a lot of, of grave worship, there was a lot of acts that were prohibited by the Sharia and by Islam. So he started calling the people away from these type of acts and calling them to the pure worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed a certain person, a certain leader, a certain ruler of that time to accept his da'wah, to accept his, uh, his call, so that this ruler then joined ranks with Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab and together, together they managed to unify the Arabia of their time and also to prevent and prohibit these people from the types of shirk and the types of innovations that they were doing. Now Muhammad ibn al-Wahhab, uh, the person himself, almost everyone has heard of him. He is either loved or hated by almost everyone today. He is not all, either loved or hated. His enemies hate him and his, uh, the people that know the sunnah, they love him. And I'd like to point out to you that this book of his, Kitab al-Tawheed, is considered to be one of the spearhead books that he used in his quote-unquote revolution or his quote-unquote uh, renovation. Not innovation, but renovation of the religion of Islam. He renovated the religion of Islam. In other words, tajdeed. He brought it back to the original roots that it was. And now the reason we're going to study this book in particular, while we study this book, I want you to have a very open mind, a very clear mind, and see for yourselves how much did the author himself speak and how much he let Allah and his messenger speak. And see for yourselves, is Muhammad ibn, Wahhab, ibn Abdul Wahhab calling to something which is new or calling to something which has existed for thousands and thousands of or for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you will see, inshallah, that the author in this book, 
He rarely says anything. All he says is Allah says this and his messenger says that. And Allah says this and his messenger says that. So how can it be then that a person opposes these type of teachings? Muhammad ibn Abu Wahhab, the person, we don't exalt or glorify him or put him above his status. No, he was a human being, he lived and he died. So we don't worship him, we don't exalt him, nothing of this nature. However, we say to those that oppose his message, not in defense of the personality of this person, but in defense of his teachings, we say to them, what you are opposing, what you are opposing is the truth. And like we pointed out, and like we say over and over again, a person only has to study the teachings of this person and the teachings of the people before him and the ones after him to realize that he did not come forth with something new. He was not the leader of a group. He was not the one who founded this group or founded this movement, unlike many of the movements that exist today that have specific founders. No. And this book that we are going to study today, inshallah, will clearly prove that. And I want you, like I said, if anyone has any doubts in his mind, fine, attend these classes and see for yourselves how much did Muhammad ibn al Wahhab himself add or subtract from this religion or did he just present the religion again did he just present the Quranic ayat and the hadith pertaining to Tawheed and pertaining to the true worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the da'wah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did through his hands was, was a blessed da'wah and because of this the whole continent or the whole peninsula of Arabia returned back to Tawheed after it was immersed in the concept of shirk, of grave worship of worshipping of dead saints, of, of blindly following people when Muhammad ibn al Wahhab came, he renovated the whole region of Islam again in this peninsula, in this continent. And because of that, he was opposed by many of the people of his times. He was opposed specifically by the people who were in power because they, they felt that his da'wah would be a threat to their power. His da'wah would be a threat to their stability. So they opposed him and they got the help of the British against him. And this is a long historical, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the history of it we don't, we don't want to get involved in but inshallah the gist of it was by the time that he passed away alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused his da'wah to be accepted by the people and how could it not be accepted because it was only a call to the return of the Quran and Sunnah it was only a, uh, if you like a rejuvenation if you like of the real religion of Islam after it had been for a long time covered up and, uh, by a lot of lies and deceits by the scholars of his time uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab passed away in the year 1207 I believe in the year 1207 and uh, 1206 excuse me at the age of 91 a very ripe alhamdulillah very full life he lived he passed away in the year 1206 Hijriya in the city of Riyadh uh, the book of his like we said is one of his most important works and inshallah we will study it chapter by chapter sentence by sentence word by word so that inshallah when you finish from these three and a half or four weeks you will have a pure total understanding of this work which like we said is composed of only Quranic ayat and a hadith it doesn't say anything of his all it is is Quranic ayat and a hadith all he did was compile it into this specific book and put chapters on top of it um, now the system we're going to use in uh, explaining the book is that I'm going to ask Brother Hood to read every section of the book every verse or every hadith one by one when we get to that section and this is a system which is well known amongst the scholars is that this is the way that they explain a book is that one of the persons he reads the book to the, to the person that's going to explain it point by point and then the person he gives an explanation of, of what was read to him now this has a number of benefits firstly and foremost it makes it clear in the minds of the audience what is the text of the book and what is the explanation by the person who is giving the explanation and the problem that I noticed is that I've explained this book a number of times before in English is that people would get confused between what the author himself said and what the explanation was because the explanation obviously also contains Quran and Hadith so in order to remove that uh, problem is that what I've asked Brother Hu to do is that he's going to read to me uh, the book point by point, hadith by hadith, ayah by ayah and then whatever he reads you know that that is part of the book and inshallah you'll have a copy of the book in front of you so that you can also go back to that and whatever I say is the explanation of the book so you can make a clear differentiation between the actual book and then the actual explanation of the book with that we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Naam Kitab Tawheed Okay the author entitled his book Kitab al-Tawheed or the book of Tawheed now what is the meaning of the word Tawheed Tawheed is uh, based from the root word Wahada Tawheed is based from the root word Wahada Waha and that and the has a shadda on top of it Wahada now Wahada means to ascribe unity to something to ascribe unity to an object Wahada means to ascribe unity to something. So he made something or some concept or some person one.
So Tawheed then is the act of this is the act of ascribing unity to something. And when it comes to Islamic sciences, this was the linguistic definition. When it comes to Islamic sciences, Tawheed refers to the unification of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. If you like the uniqueness of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala when it comes to His lordship, His right to be worshipped, and His names and attributes. So Tawheed then is that we single out Allah. We make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unique. We make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one in three concepts, in three aspects. The first one was Tawheed of Lordship. And in Arabic this is called, and I want you to write down these Arabic terms, some basic Arabic terms I'm going to dictate to you. Tawheed al-Rububiyya. Tawheed al-Rububiyya. Okay, Tawheed of Lordship. Tawheed al-Rububiyya. This Tawheed, or this, this uh, classification of Tawheed, or this categorization of Tawheed, is obviously based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The meaning of Tawheed al-Rububiyya is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one in the fact that He is the only one who created all of mankind and all of the creation. And He is the only one who sustains all of mankind and all of the creation. And He is the only one who has control of all of the creation. So in other words, if someone were to ask you who, who is your creator, you would respond Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is Tawheed al-Rububiyya. Okay? In other words, the fact that we only have one creator, and one sustainer, and one nourisher, and one deity who is in charge of the affairs of all of the creation. Only one. This is from the, based on the Arabic root, Rabb, meaning the Lord. You say, Ya Rabb, O oh my Lord. The, from the same root is Tawheed al-Rububiyya. Is that the unity of Lordship. Inshallah, we will discuss Tawheed al-Rububiyya in more detail in the weekend section, or in the weekend sessions that we have on the Arkan. The second category of Tawheed that we mentioned is what Tawheed of? Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, Tawheed of worship. Okay? The, second category, the second category of Tawheed is Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, or the Tawheed of worship. Um, brother, there's a space over there if you want. Inshallah. Okay. And I think there's some left too. Where the, brother comes. the Tawheed of worship. What this entails, this is the natural follow-up of Tawheed al-Rububiyya. Once you have acknowledged that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your creator and your only creator, once you have acknowledged that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your sustainer and nourisher and the one that gives you your life and your food and everything, the logical consequence or the logical follow-up from that is that you worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you can't take another one. Okay, there's, there's one back there, yeah. Uh, the logical consequence or the follow-up of that is that you acknowledge that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to be worshipped. And this is called Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. That, uh, that the, the Tawheed of worship. Okay? The last category of Tawheed is the Tawheed of names and attributes of Allah. Tawheed of Asma'i wa Sifat. Asma means name, Sifat means attributes. Okay? So the Tawheed of names and attributes of Allah. Tawheed of Asma' wa Sifat. Okay, names and attributes. Now what does this mean? Again, this is a logical follow-up from Rububiyya. A logical follow-up from Rububiyya. If you have acknowledged that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator and the only creator, this automatically implies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessed with certain attributes, certain qualities that are perfect and cannot be, if you like, they are perfect, they are flawless, they are the ones that befit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, the attribute of creation the attribute of knowledge, the attribute of power, the attribute of, of, of every single perfect attribute, if you like. It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the tawheed of asma'i wa sifat. Is that we affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala those perfect names and attributes that are found in the Quran and the Sunnah. And we deny from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every negative attribute. Every negative attribute, we say Allah is free of this attribute. Again, found in the Quran and the Sunnah. So, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms for himself, he calls himself Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahim, that the ever-merciful and the bestower of mercy. He calls himself Al-Allam al ghuyub that the one who knows the unseen. He calls himself Allah, which is one of the names of Allah. One of the names of Allah is Allah. And we were going we to discuss this name, inshallah, in a little while. He calls himself Al-Ghaffar, the one who forgives. He calls himself Al-Ra'uf, Ar-Rahim, the ever-merciful, so on and so forth. All of these names and attributes, they form a part of Tawheed al-Asma'i wa sifat That we affirm for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything that he affirmed for himself. And we deny from him all negative attributes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has denied from himself sleep. He says, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala neither does slumber overtake him nor sleep. He has also denied for himself having, this, having a son or a wife. 
He had, and, and, and he has denied this in very strong terms in the Quran, which is what the, which, which is what the Christians accuse him of, of having a son or a wife. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala denies this because this is an imperfect attribute. Okay? So this comes under Tawheed al Asma'i wa Sifat. Now, realize that most of mankind, majority of mankind, they accepted Tawheed al Rububiyyah. They accepted the Tawheed of Lordship. So if you were to go to a Christian right now and you ask him, who created you? He will say, God the Father. And this is their concept that there is one God. If you ask him, who is the one that gives you your life and the one that is sustaining you and giving you all, of the, all that you have of food and water and drink, he will say, God the Father. Okay? Likewise, if you were to go to a Jew, he would also tell you the same thing. If you were to go to many of the different sects and groups that are prevalent, in our time and in the past, historically, you will find that almost all of them, even the Hindus, and you say the Hindus, they are idol worshippers. Yes, but you ask them. You worship these idols, yes, but who created you and who created these idols? They will say Krishna or Rama or whatever main deity they have, or Brahma. The, the different uh, Hindus, they have different uh, deities, the main deity. But all of the Hindus, they go back to one main god. One main god. They say the main god is Vishnu or Rama or Krishna, whatever they have, the one main god. They will go back to him. And they say that all of these other gods, they are subservient or under this main god. Okay? So, Tawheed al rububiyyah is something which very, very few groups and religions have, have denied. Even the Romans. Who was the main god of the Romans? And the Greeks. Who was the main god of the Greeks? Zeus. Also, the Romans, I don't remember the names, but they had an equivalent of Zeus. You realize the, 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 the Romans take from the Greeks or vice versa? The Greeks, they, yeah, the Romans, they just basically took the religion of the Greeks and changed the names and, and adopted it, right? But the point is, there is one main god, even in their uh, mythology, there is one main god, Zeus. My point that I'm trying to stress is this Tawheed, Tawheed al-Rubiyya, is ingrained in the very nature of man. That he realizes and acknowledges that there has to be only one god, one creator. Therefore, you find almost all of the religions on, on the face of this earth that are present and those that have existed in the past, they never denied God. Atheism has always been a minority. Atheism has always been a mi- minority because atheism is what goes against this type of Tawheed. The opposite to this type of Tawheed is the rejection of God. Okay? And this has always been a minority. Even in our times, believe it or not, the majority of mankind, as everyone knows, is somehow religious. If you were to ask him, are you an atheist or are you a Christian? The majority of, of, of America and the Western would say, we are Christian, we believe in, 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 in Jesus Christ or whatever they believe in. In other words, atheism has always been a, a, a small philosophy. And you find that even those countries that are supposedly atheists, they do have some type of religious belief, some type of religious act, even though they don't call them as such. Because it's, it's almost impossible to go against this type of tawheed. Now there is one religion though, that went against this type of Tawheed. And they actually believed that there were two creators, two gods. Who can mention, who can name to me this religion? Zoroastrians, exactly. The Zoroastrians, they actually went against, you know what the Zoroastrians are? The fire worshippers. Okay, they're Majus. Um, the Parsis, or the Farsis we call them also in uh, certain countries. Okay? They worship fire. Okay? This group, they actually believed in two gods. They actually believed that there are two gods. They said there's a god of good and then there's a god of evil. Each of these two gods is independent and all-powerful and almighty. Okay? And this is one of the very, very few religions that actually went against Tawheed al rububiyyah There's space, inshallah, over there. Yeah. Um, so like we said, this type of Tawheed, and we're going to discuss this type of Tawheed in more detail next time, what does it entail? It entails acknowledging that there is only one creator, and one sustainer, and one cherisher. This is what we call Rabb. You know the word Rabb, Arabic word Rabb, everyone knows it. Ya Rabbi, you always call it in dua. In the dua, you say, oh my Lord. It's based from this root, that we say that there is only one God. Now, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, this is where the majority of mankind has strayed and fallen into error. Okay, what is Tawheed al uluhiyya Akhi? What is Tawheed al uluhiyya No, that's Rububiyya. What is Uluhiyya, the second category? Acknowledging that Allah and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to be worshipped. This is where the majority of mankind went astray. Okay, now if you were to ask the Christians, who created you? They're going to say God the Father. They get, then you ask them, who do you worship? Who do you go through to get to God? Who do you think salvation lies in? They'll say Jesus Christ. 
Okay? Likewise, you go to the Hindu and you say, who created you or who created your gods? They will say their main god, Brahma or, uh, or uh, uh, Vishnu or whatever they have. Now you will ask them, who do you worship? And they will point to you a million gods that they have. We worship this, we worship this, we worship this, we worship this. Likewise, every religious group or sect that you look, if you were to ask them who created you, they're going to say the one God. But then you, when you look at their acts and who they worship, you realize that this is now where they're falling into error. This is now where they go astray. The Tawheed of Uluhiyya, the Tawheed of worship. And this is where the danger point lies. Not in Rububiyya. Because all of mankind, almost all of mankind acknowledges that Allah exists. And acknowledges, even though they don't call Him, they don't call him by this name, but they do call Him by some name. Okay? And they acknowledge that He is the true Creator. But now when it comes to the worship of this Creator, when it comes to what do we worship, how do we obtain salvation, how do we enter Jannah or the everlasting life or whatever they want to call it, this is where they fall into error and this is where they go astray. And they worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And likewise, when they do this, then this automatically messes up the, th- the third category of Tawheed, which is Asma'i wa Sifat, names and categories. Why is this? This is because when a person goes through, for example, Jesus Christ, okay, this automatically implies that he believes Jesus Christ is more loving and caring than God the Father. So this is shirk, this is association of partners in Tawheed of Asma'i wa Sifat. When he goes through another idol, another deity, he automatically, he's, what he is saying, even though he might not verbalize it, what he is implying is that this God or this idol or this person or this object or this tree can hear my prayers and respond to them, can hear my prayers and respond to them in a manner better than the main God, God the Father, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or whatever they want to call them. Okay? So the point is, every time a person falls into shirk, which is the opposite of tawhid, which we're going to get to, in tawhid al-uluhiyya, this automatically implies that he has fallen into shirk in tawhid al-asma'i wa sifat. In other words, when you mess up, when you change around, when you destroy who you worship, in other words, you start worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you automatically destroy the concept of the unique names and attributes of Allah. And this is why when you go to the Christians, why do, you, why do they worship Jesus Christ? Because they believe that Jesus Christ loves them more than God does. That they believe that their salvation is through this human being. They believe that Jesus Christ can respond to their prayers better than God does. And this is, this is a type of, of uh, this is blasphemy against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there is a creation that is more knowledgeable of the needs of the creation and loves them more than Allah. This is not possible. Okay? So my point is you have to understand these three categories of tawheed. This is very important. And the rest of the, the series of lectures are, is going to always go, going to be referring back to this concept of tawheed. Um, you can get a table from back there. The table back there. Uh, the, rest, uh, the rest of our series of lectures, we're always going to go back to these concepts of Tawheed. I want you all to memorize them right now. How many categories are that we mentioned? Three. The first one is in Arabic. Tawheed al-Rububiyya. Rububiyya. Okay? And this means unity of lordship. And the concept is that there is only one God, one creator, one sustainer and cherisher. The second concept of Tawheed is Uluhiyya. Okay, is that clear? Uluhiyya, which means that there is only one deity, one God, that has the right to be worshipped. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? If you, and we're going to define worship in a little while also. The third category of Tawheed is Asma'i wa Sifat, names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has those unique names and unique characteristics and unique attributes that are attributes of perfection and glory and majesty. And he does not have negative or, or attributes that do not befit him. Okay? Now, with that, uh, we start with the book, inshallah. Chapter 1 At Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. Allah the Almighty says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I created not the jinns and men except that they should worship me. Okay, in this chapter. Now realize this book, Kitab al-Tawheed, right? The one that we're going to study now, the ones that are in front, the, the book that is in front of you now. Even though it discusses all three types of Tawheed, it concentrates on uluhiyya. It concentrates on the Tawheed of uluhiyya. In other words, that only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has the right to be worshipped. Okay. So realize this from the start: is that even though it's going to, we're going to briefly mention all three types. We're going to get there in this book. The main emphasis of this book is the second category of Tawheed, Uluhiyya. And we also mentioned that this is one of the most important categories, if you like, because this is where everyone falls into error. All of the other religious groups fall into error. Okay? So, when we start from this book, you should realize from the outset, have in your mind 
that this book concentrates on the second type of Tawheed, which is that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to be worshipped. So in this book, we're going to define worship. And we're going to define the various ways that a person worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The various ways that a person must worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this book, we're also going to define the opposite of this type of worship, which is shirk. And we're going to define various manifestations. We're going to give examples of how shirk occurs and how it is ever present in this ummah. Now the author will start off with six chapters. Okay, I'm roughly dividing the book up here for you. The author will, div- will start off with six chapters. Okay, the first one is a general introduction, which is what we hope to cover today, inshallah. It's a general introduction to Tawheed and what is Tawheed and the importance of Tawheed. The next five chapters, in other words, chapters 2, 2, 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, five chapters. Okay, the next five chapters, they are all of them devoted to the same concept. And that is emphasizing the importance of Tawheed. Tawheed in all of its three branches. Emphasizing the importance of Tawheed. Now these five chapters will emphasize the importance of Tawheed, each one from a different perspective. So much so that when we, when we finish with these five chapters, we will realize and understand the greatness of this concept. The beautiful, or the very, the, the importance of this concept cannot be overemphasized. And we will understand that after we cover these five chapters. After these five chapters, the author then talks about the various ways that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of love and fear and hope and how, and how shirk or how association occurs in, man, in, in various manifestations. And he mainly emphasizes the minor types of shirk, which we call shirk al azhar And the major types of shirk will come towards the end of the book. We'll get to them later on, inshaAllah. Now the author starts off, the first verse of the Quran he quotes is, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Is that I have not created men and jinn except to worship me. Now this verse... This verse, which is verse 56 of Surah Dhariyat, is the most explicit verse in the Qur'an concerning the purpose of creation. I repeat, this verse is the most explicit verse in the entire Qur'an concerning the purpose of creation. Nowhere else in the Qur'an has the purpose of creation been so clearly defined, have the goals of creation been outlined in such explicit terms. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have not created man and jinn except. In other words, you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has denied every reason for creation except for one. I have not created man and jinn except to worship me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has negated, He has denied that there is no reason for creation except one. There is no reason for creation except one. And what is that? Except to worship me. Illa liya'budun except to worship me. So if someone were to ask you, why have you been created on the face of this earth? You, you, the response will be, I have been created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is my goal for existence. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and Eve. This is why He created Jannah and Nal. This is why He revealed the books. This is why He sent the messengers. This is why everything that we know exists today. So realize this importance, the concept of this uh, worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawheed is that the very purpose of creation is Tawheed. We have not been created except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on in this verse and He says, مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ uh, This is not in your books. Remember, everything I say, you will not find in the book in general. What, the, what, what, is, uh, what is the text of the book? Brother Hud is going to uh, read to you. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next verse after this, verse 57, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I, have not, uh, I do not want from them any sustenance nor do I want them to feed me, rather it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who feeds everyone. Now the point of these verses is that someone might presume, a non-Muslim, he might presume, well in that case God, need, God is in need of us, because He wants us to worship Him. So in order to shatter this presumption, in order to remove this evil thought from a person's mind, Allah then continues in the next verses, and He says, I don't want any sustenance, you can't benefit me in any way. I don't want any food from you. Rather, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is I who gives everything to you. So in order to remove this misconception that might possibly arise when a person reads this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on and He removes this, this presumption by saying that I don't need anything from you. I don't need, you will not be able to benefit me in the slightest. Rather, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gives you all that you have. Okay? Now, like I said, this verse is the most explicit verse concerning the purpose of creation. Now, what is the meaning of worship though? 
Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says here, I have not created man and jinn except to worship me. So the obvious question that arises is, what is the meaning of worship? Now the linguistic meaning of worship, linguistically, uh, from the, the word ibadah, um, the linguistic meaning of it means to humble yourself. To have, uh, uh, to have a sense of humbleness and, and submissiveness, if you like, to another person or another object. This is why a slave in Arabic is called abd, from the same root as ya'budun, ya'budun, which is what occurs in this uh, verse. The same root I'm saying. The slave in Arabic is called an abd, because he humbles himself, he submits himself to his master or his owner. Okay, the same root. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I have not created man and jinn except to worship me, and the same root of worship is also the same root of slave. In other words, it is as if you have submitted yourself, totally, your heart, your soul, everything, to this creator, to this... Uh, Cherisher and Lord of yours. Now, obviously, how this creation is, how this worship is done, is that you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything that He commands you to do, and you leave everything that He forbids you from. You obey everything that He commands you to do, and you leave everything that He forbids you from. And this is the essence of Islam. This is the essence of Islam. What is the meaning of Islam? Submission. Islam is. From the, uh, it, it means istislam in Arabic, which means to submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, to give yourself up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah tells you, you will do it. Whatever He forbids you from doing, you will stay away from it. Again, we're going around the same concept over and over again. The, the aspect of worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the purpose of creation, and the meaning of Islam. So a Muslim is one who has, what has he done? Submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim... By the way, Islam does not mean peace. It does not mean, linguistically I'm saying, yes, Islam stands for peace and the connotation of Islam are peace, yes. But I'm saying linguistically, Islam does not mean peace. Islam means submission, linguistically. Of course, the religion of Islam will bring peace in this life and the akhir. I'm not denying that. But what I'm saying is linguistically, many people, they have this concept, Islam means peace. Incorrect, totally false. Islam means submission. Okay, so a Muslim is one who has submitted himself, i.e. worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like a servant or a slave does to his master. Okay, and like I said, this verse is the most explicit verse concerning the purpose of creation. There is no other verse in the Quran that is as explicit as this verse outlining the goals of creation. A side point or a side benefit of this verse is that there are two um, created species that have been given uh, preference and status over others, and that is the, 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 the species of man and the species of jinn. These are the two species that Allah subhanahu wa, subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested with intellect and with a type of free will. Okay? No other species has been given this type of intellect and free will that man and jinn have been given. Even angels, they have not been given the type of free will in which they can disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though they are more holy than man. Yet they don't have a free will to disobey Allah. So Allah, in, the, in this verse, He mentions two categories of creation. Even though Allah created everything. He created the trees, He created the stars, He created a animals, insects, He created uh, angels. But in this verse, He only mentions two aspects of creation, or two points of creation. Man and jinn. The reason being that He mentioned these two above all the rest is because only these two have been given a type of free will. And inshallah we're going to discuss the concept of Qadr in one of the weekends, uh, predestination. And that they have been given the intellect. Animals don't have this type of intellect. Animals cannot think and reason for themselves. Man and jinn on the other hand do have this type of intellect. This is why animals and angels and all of the creation, they can never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never, ever, they cannot possibly disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are always under the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas mankind and jinn, these are the only two peop uh, creation and species, because they have been given free will, they can disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they choose to do so. And this is their own loss in this life and the hereafter if they do so. Um, again, we're going to discuss the concept of predestination and, and, and free will uh, in more detail in one of the weekend sessions, inshallah. Now, everyone knows what man is. We're one of them. What is a jinn? The, a jinn is made, uh, a jinn is basically another creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which He has hidden from us. We cannot see it. We cannot uh, communicate with it in general. Uh, that He has created from a smokeless fire, and which existed before mankind was created. Jinn was created before mankind. Okay, how do we know this? Very good. Th that Adam alayhi salam was made after shaitan. Shaitan existed when Adam was, was created. And shaitan was of the angels or the jinn? He was of the jinn. 
He was not of the angels, he was of the jinn. Had he been of the angels, he could not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because he was of the jinn, when Allah commanded him to prostrate to Adam, out of arrogance, only out of arrogance, he refused to prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So we know then that the jinn are a separate species, a separate creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. He has given them certain powers that he has not given us, and he has given us certain powers that he has not given them. Okay, you understand that? That jinn has certain powers that we have not been given. Of those powers is that they move very fast, is that they cannot be seen by us, they can transform their shape and form. Okay? And of the powers that we have been given over them, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the control of, for example, uh, yani certain, uh, certain animals that the jinn do not have control of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for us, uh, for example, the ship Allah mentions in many verses, He has created for us the ships, the vessels that, shale, that sail in the ocean. You know, we have control over certain things that they don't have control over. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed mankind with a greater intellect than that of the jinn. Even though both are intelligent. But mankind is more intelligent in general than the jinn are. Jinns, if you like, they are more of a brute force. They are more like, you know, uh, of a brute nature, if you like. More of an animalistic nature. Mankind is a more refined, if you like, instinct. More intellectual than the jinn are. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preferred, of the two, He has preferred mankind over jinn. How do we know this? How do we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed mankind over jinn? Yeah, exactly. That He tells the malaika and the jinn, He tells them to perform sajda to Adam. So this shows them that the jinn are of a less or an inferior nature to mankind. Even though both, like we said, have been given a type of free will. Is there nothing? Even though both, like we said, have been given a free will. For your information and a point of benefit, whenever you find the two letters, jim and noon, jannah, Whenever you find Jim and Noon in any Arabic phrase that come together, know that this word has an aspect of hiddenness to it. Yani it's hidden from mankind. So for example, Jinn, right? The reason they are, that they are called Jinn is because they are hidden from our sights. Jannah, which is the Garden of Paradise, is called Jannah because it's hidden from us. We don't know it. It's, it's, it's in the hereafter. Likewise, the uh, embryo in the mother of its stomach in the stomach of its mother, excuse me, is called Jinin, okay? Jen, from the same root, Jannah, Jinin, okay? That you cannot see it, okay? Likewise, madness is called Jinnah, with a kasra, not Jannah, Jinnah. Why? Because you cannot see the madness. It's something that is hidden from you. So, a point of benefit is that every time these two letters, Jim and Noon, they occur next to each other in any word of the Arabic language, realize that there is something that is hidden. In other words, this word implies something that is hidden. Okay, now, uh, this was the first verse. Now we want move on to the second one, inshallah. Just read the English so we can save time. And he stated, And verily we have sent among every ummah a messenger proclaiming, Worship Allah and avoid paghut. Okay, now sex, the next verse, or the second verse that the author mentions is the 36th verse of Surah An-Naml. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولًا أَنْ إِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَجِتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ That وَلَقَدْ that of a surety, and this is a type of oath or a type of swearing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Qur'an, which provides an emphasis to the fact, okay? Obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need any emphasis. Whatever Allah says is true. But when Allah emphasizes something in the Qur'an, our ears should perk up. That subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though He doesn't need to emphasize something, He is emphasizing something anyway to show how important it is. So whenever Allah gives an oath in the Qur'an, وَالْعَصْرِ By time, okay? وَالْلَيْلِ that by the night, duha by the four, by the dawn or by the sun when it rises. Whenever Allah gives an oath, or whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes something more emphatic, emphasizes something, then we should realize that what Allah is going to say is very important. Because Allah is not in need of emphasizing something. It is humans who are in need of something. When someone says, for example, you say that uh, so and so came, okay? Who will say, No, he didn't come. In order to emphasize what you said, you will say, I swear by Allah he did come. For sure he came. So you need to emphasize it to prove your truthfulness. Okay? But is Allah in need of this type of emphasis? No. So when Allah emphasizes something, then the meaning of this is that what is going to follow is very important. So we should pay attention to it. We should be careful what's coming next. So Allah says, Wa la qad. And if those of you that know Arabic, there are three emphasis in this verses. The wow, which is uh, meant to, to give an oath or swear. The lam, which is a type of emphasis. And the qad, which is a type of emphasis. Three emphasis are given in this verse. The beginning of this verse. So imagine... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in need of any emphasis. Had He given one, it would have been sufficient. Two, three in this verse. So imagine how important the fact that Allah is sitting in this verse. Allah goes on and He says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا That indeed we have sent in every nation, in every people, in every tribe, in every 
every nation that has ever existed, we have sent a messenger. What is the purpose of this messenger? This messenger proclaims worship Allah and avoid Tawhut. We're going to define Tawhut in a little while. But the point of this verse is that it shows us the universality, the compl- the the there's no other word for universality, <laughs> the the similarity, if you like, or the same, the uniqueness that every messenger came with the same concept. Every messenger from the time of Adam until the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they had the same message, the same theme, the same concept, over and over again. What is this concept? Worship Allah and avoid Tawhut. What is Tawhut? Let us define Tawhut and then we'll go back to the verse. Tawhut, the root word of Tawhut implies overstepping the bounds, going, going outside the boundaries. So suppose you have a boundary, you have a fence around a place. If someone were to go across this fence, in Arabic you could say, Tagha, he went beyond the boundaries. Okay? And this root is the same root as Tagha, as, as Tawhut, as, as what we're discussing now. So Tawhut then, is everything that takes you out of the boundaries of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every object, every concept, every false deity, every idol, every person, whether living or dead, that takes you out of the pure worship, which is the boundaries of Allah. The pure worship of Allah, this thing is called Tawhut. So Tawhut, it could be an idol. Why? Because when you worship that idol, what does it do? It takes you away from the boundaries of what? Tawheed. Tawhut, it could be um, your leaders, in a way. If your leaders tell you to do something which is prohibited and you follow them, what are you doing? You are going out of the boundaries that Allah has revealed. Okay? Tawhut could be sorcerers and magicians. Why? Because they do something and we're going to come to sorcery and magic in a few chapters. Okay? Because they take you outside the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawhut could be a living person, a living quote-unquote scholar, an evil scholar, who misdirects you, who misguides you away from the true path. So Tawhut then is a comprehensive term implying everything that takes you out of the pure worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, after we have defined Tawhut, everyone understands Tawhut? Everyone understands Tawhut, right? Is that every concept, it could be a concept, it could be a philosophy. For example, communism, okay? Capitalism in its pure essence, in its, in its full shell. All of these type of philosophies, democracy in the shell, that, in, the, in, the, in the way that we recognize it in the West, all of these, these types of philosophies are Tawhut. Why? Because they take you out of the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They mislead you and misguide you away from the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we go back to the verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in this verse that we have not sent, or we have sent every, to every nation a messenger. We have sent to every nation a messenger. What was the purpose or the goal of this messenger? Is to emphasize one concept over and over and over again. Is that worship Allah and avoid these false deities, avoid these false philosophies, avoid everything that will lead you astray from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, now the point of this verse, like we mentioned, like we like we uh, mentioned, is that it shows to us, it proves to us that every prophet came with the same message. What message did he come with? Tawheed. This is the crux of Tawheed. Every prophet came with the same message. Like Allah says in another verse, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَهَ أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ Surah, uh, Surah Anbiya, verse 25. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, We have not sent before you any messenger, meaning before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, We have not sent before you any messenger, except that we inspired him with one thing, لا إله إلا أنا. There is no God except me, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so worship me. Likewise, in Surah An-Nahl, uh, verse 36, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ الرَّسُولًا Oh, it's the same one, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's different. But it's the, same, it's the same verse, but it occurs twice in the Quran, excuse me. The same verse occurs twice in the Quran. Surah Nahl, and, uh, Surah Nahl verse 36, is also the same as uh, Surah An-Naml, which we're, the verse that we're discussing now. That we have sent in every community a prophet who proclaims the same thing. Worship Allah and avoid false taghut. Now, the next verse. And he said, And your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him, and that you be dutiful to your parents. If one of them or both of them attain old age in your life, say not to them a word of disrespect, nor shout at them, but address them in terms of honor, and lower unto them the wing of submission and humility through mercy, and say, My Lord, bestow on them your mercy, as they did bring me up when I was small. Okay, now, the next 
three verses if you like. The author is going to mention three verses of the Quran, all of which are a series of commands and prohibitions. Okay, in other words, they are very comprehensive verses in that they instruct mankind in, if you like, the gist of the religion of Islam. They are very comprehensive verses that they, they, they basically summarize Islam. He's going to mention three verses in the first one of them. The point of every verse, the point of every verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts these commands and prohibitions with one concept. Always. So, for example, in these verses, verse 23 of Surah Al-Isra, that your Lord has decreed, in other words, your Lord has willed, that you will not worship anything except Him. You will worship none except Him. So again, and then, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on, and we don't have time to discuss uh, the entire verse, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on about treatment with parents, and tre- treatment with orphans, and treatment with other people. The point is, these verses, they form, if you like, a summary of Islam. They summarize the concept of Islam. Now, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala start off these verses? By the concept of Tawheed. That your Lord has decreed, in other words, this is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That your Lord has decreed that you will worship none except Him. Now we have, to, we have to realize something now, is that the way that our shahada is structured, La ilaha illallah, it composes or it comprises two aspects, negation and affirmation. Negation and affirmation. What do I mean by this? Everyone seems confused. What do I mean by negation and affirmation? Okay, what is affirmation? Affirmation means, for example, to say, Muhammad is standing. Muhammad is standing. If I were to say Muhammad is standing, I'm affirming the fact that Muhammad is standing, obviously. But does this negate the fact that other people might be standing? In other words, if I said Muhammad, was, Muhammad is standing, how about Zayd? Is he standing or sitting? Is there anything said about him? No. Okay, so this is affirmation. Affirmation is, if you like, slightly eloquent. That you give it, that you emphasize a certain aspect. Negation, Muhammad is not standing. Okay? Muhammad is not standing. I negate the fact that Muhammad is standing. How about Zayd? Is there any mention made of Zayd here? Is he standing or sitting? Everyone seems confused. (laughs) Huh? As a practical example? Okay, stand up, Yaqi. What's your name again? Abdurrahman, right? Okay. Abdurrahman is standing. Okay. I'm only mentioning Abdurrahman here. Okay. How about... Stand up, Yaqi. How about the, the brother, what did, you, which, what did you say your name was? Your, your, your name, Yaqi? Uh, Parish? Yeah. Parish, okay. How about Parish? Did I even mention Parish? Is he standing or not? There's no mention made of Parish. If I say, Abdurrahman is standing, okay, there's no mention made of anyone else. The rest of the class is sitting and one is standing up. So now if I were to say, Allah is God, okay, Allah is God, this is affirmation. I am affirming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is God. But am I saying that there are other gods besides him or am I, am, I, am I staying quiet about that? I'm staying quiet about that. No other mention is made of other gods. Likewise, when I say Abdurrahman is standing, I'm not mentioning Parish. Parish might be standing or sitting. I'm not mentioning Muhammad. I'm not mentioning Abdurrahim. I'm not mentioning all of the other brothers sitting here. So this is, no mention is made of them. My point that I'm trying to get across to you, inshallah, is that only by combining affirmation and negation will I be able to come across with the full message. If I were to say, that no one is standing except Abdul Rahman. Okay, now you're going to have to sit down, Paris. Okay. No one is standing except Abdul Rahman. Now what have I done? I have negated the fact that anyone is standing. And I have affirmed that only one person is standing, Abdul Rahman. Okay? Everyone else is sitting down here. Okay? Now when I say there is no God except Allah, I have negated the fact there cannot exist any other God. No other God exists. No other deity exists except one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? The point is when you com- you can sit down around. The point is when you combine affirmation and negation, only then will you come out with the full perspective or the full picture. This is the height of eloquence. Okay? Am I making any sense or are you still lost? Only by saying for example, like I go back to the, the, the kalima. If I say Allah is the Rabb, Allah is Lord. Well, just by this statement, someone could say, Well, so is Zeus, so is Rama, so is Krishna. Because all I'm saying is Allah is God. I'm not saying no one else is God. Okay? Now, if I say the opposite, Zeus is not God. Zeus is not God. Okay? Well, okay, Zeus is not God, but there might still be other gods out. This is negation. Only when I combine affirmation with negation, and I say, La ilaha, there is no deity, there is no God 
illallah, except for except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only then am I coming across with the full picture. Am I getting across the full implication? Is that there is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Your Lord has decreed that you worship none except Him. So this is negation and then affirmation. This is the point that I'm trying to come, come across to you by. Okay? Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first denies. He says, Your Lord has decreed that you worship none, which means anything. You worship none, this is negation. Accept Him, this is affirmation. So Allah has denied everything. Everything else is blacked out. And only one thing now is worthy of worship. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Uh, Brother Hood has temporarily left. So, oh, he's back. Okay. So if we can move on to the next verse, inshallah. Yeah, the very next one. Just move on. And Allah says, Worship Allah and join none with Him in worship. Okay, again, we've gone over this uh, similar verse. Is that... Again, there is affirmation and negation. Okay? Worship Allah and don't commit shirk or don't worship anything else with Him. And you will always find that when the Quran talks about Tawheed, it always combines affirmation and negation because this is the height of eloquence. Like I said, if you were only to use affirmation, you would not be eloquent. If you were only to use negation, you would not be eloquent. If I say Allah is God, okay, someone might say there's still, there are other gods besides Allah. Billah. If I were to say Zeus is not God, which is negation, Okay, or Rama is not God, or Krishna is not God, someone will say, okay, these things are not God, but there are still other gods out there. Only when I combine the two, and I say, worship Allah, and don't worship anything except Him. Like this verse says, only then am I coming across with this concept of Tawheed, that only one object, one, one deity, has that right to worship. Now the next verse. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, come, I will recite what your Lord has prohibited you from. Join not anything in worship with him. Be good and dutiful to your parents. Kill not your children because of poverty. We provide sustenance for you and for them. Come not near to shameful sins, whether committed openly or secretly. And kill not anyone whom Allah has forbidden, except for a just cause. This he has commanded you that you may understand. And come not near to the orphan's property, except to improve it until he or she attains the age of full strength, and give full measure and full weight with justice. We burden not any person, but that which he can bear. And whenever you give your word, say the truth, even if a near relative is concerned, and fulfill the covenant of Allah. This he commands you, that you may remember. And verily this is my straight path, so follow it, and follow not other paths, for they will separate you from, my, from his path. This he has ordained for you that you may become al muttaqun the pious. Okay, now in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once again, like, like we said, there's going to be three series of verses which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has summarized the essence of Islam by giving a list of commands and prohibitions. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Once again, every time he starts these series of verses, he starts it with one theme, one concept, one topic, tawheed. Once again, we see in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Qul. Tell them Muhammad Whenever you see the word Qul in the Quran It is as if it's a command To the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam To tell them what's going to follow Once again it's a type of affirmation uh, Not affirmation It's a type of uh, emphasis It's a type of emphasis Okay That Qul Ta'ala Tell them oh Muhammad come So look at the emphasis It says that the Prophet The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Is saying Come to me I'm going to tell you something Come to me I'm going to recite to you, I'm going to tell you what your Lord has forbidden for you. Okay? In other words, these are the things that are forbidden, everything else besides this is allowed. Okay? And this is of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that the prohibited things, you can list them. Everything that's not on this list is allowed. Imagine had it been the other way around, that the allowed things, you could list them and everything besides these are prohibited. There are infinite number of things that you can do in this world. An infinite number of things you can do. So out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He prohibited for us a certain number of things, so that everything else that is not prohibited is automatically, it's de facto allowed. Okay? And this is of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to, to the Prophet Muhammad, Tell them, O Muhammad, come, I'm going to recite to you what is forbidden for you. What does Allah start off with? Allah tushriku bihi shay'a That you don't associate partners with him In other words that you worship him alone Without worshipping other objects or deities besides him Once again the point of these verses 
the point of these verses is that every time Allah starts off a series of commands and prohibitions, every time the summary of, is given of Islam, every time Islam is given in a few verses, a, a, a small summarized version if you like, every time Allah starts off with the same concept. Worship me alone, don't associate partners with me. Worship me alone, don't worship Taghut. Worship me alone, I'buduni, and don't do shirk, don't associate any partners with me. Over and over and over and over again, the one concept is, it's as if it's banged into our heads over and over again because it's so important. The concept of Tawheed. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on in a very beautiful verse. Every one of you should read it and understand it. That, uh, you know, be good to your parents and don't kill your children out of fear of poverty. And also, uh, don't kill other people and don't eat the orphan's property. Don't eat the orphan's money until they become of age. And be just with people. And when you speak, speak the truth and fulfill the covenants of Allah and fulfill the covenants of mankind. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completes uh, concludes these verses by saying This is my path This is my sabil This is my way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This is my way to Jannah Mustaqim means it's straight And this is the straight path What is the straight path? The straight path is the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us To take us from this life into Jannah And it is composed of His commandments and His prohibitions Okay So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is telling people in the Quran, through the Quran, that this is my straight path. And the first commandment of this path is what? Tawheed. The first commandment that is given in this series of verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is my path, is Tawheed. So then the, the Prophet is telling people, فَاتَّبِعُوهُ Follow this path. Take this path. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلِ And don't, don't follow other paths that will lead you astray from this path. Now the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was once sitting amongst the companions and he drew a straight line in the sand. A straight line he drew with a stick. Okay? He said, this is the straight path. For example, he's giving it a parable or an example. This is the straight path. Okay? And then he drew lines that go away from the straight path. Left and right to it. Using his stick, he drew lines that go away from this path. And he said, these are the paths of misguidance. The paths of deviation. At the head, at the, at the, at the top of every one of these paths, is a devil calling the people to go away from it. Okay? The point is, the Sirat al-Mustaqim is one. The paths of deviation are many. The way to worship Allah is one, the straight path. But the ways to commit shirk are many. The manifestations of Tawheed is one. But the manifestations of shirk are many. Truth is one. But falsehood is many. This is why in the Quran, every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the truth, He refers to it in a singular form. And every time He refers to the evil or misguidance, He refers to it in the plural form. Allah calls... Uh, the Quran, he calls it, and he calls guidance, he calls it a light in the singular, nur. But when he talks about misguidance, he says vulumat, the plural. Yani darkness is. Not just a darkness, darkness is. Why? Because truth is one. Truth is one. Understand this and realize it. Put it in your head. Truth is one. Evil and falsehood is many. The way to worship Allah, the way of this religion of Islam, it is one. There are not different versions of Islam, version 1.1, 1.2. No. Islam is. Version 1.0, that's it. Since the time of the Prophet Muhammad to the Day of Judgment. Okay? Truth is one. But the paths of evil are going to be many. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse, He says, This is my path, singular. This is my path, singular. So follow it. And do not follow other paths, plural. Why? Like we said again, the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. But the path to evil, the path to hell, the path to misguidance is many. We can't summarize them for you. But we can summarize the path of truthfulness, the path of, of, of justness, the path of Salat al Mustaqim. So when you understand this straight path, you don't need to study every single individual uh, misguiding path. You see what I'm saying? When you understand the straight path, when you know your way from point A to point B, you don't have to worry about all the other routes in the city. When you ask directions for a certain house, you don't ask, How do I not get to your house? You only ask, How do you get to the house? Salat al Mustaqim. Everything besides that you know is going to lead you astray. Okay? Likewise, the truth or the, the, the path of guidance is one and the path of misguidance is many. Uh, now the next verse or the next hadith. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, Whoever wishes to ascertain the very will of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has put his seal, let him read the statement of Allah. Say, O Muhammad, come, I will recite what your Lord has prohibited from you, you from Join not anything in worship with him up to, and verily this is my straight path. Okay, now this is a hadith of Ibn, or a statement of Ibn Mas'ud in which he states that whoever wishes to see 
the last will and testament, the wasiyah, the last will and testament that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ left and upon which his seal was put. You realize in the old days they had something called the seal, which was a, a, a ring, a unique ring. They would put that ring in wax and then they would stamp that wax upon the piece of paper. That would prove that this piece of paper was from that person. In our times we have something called signatures. <laughs> Okay, but in those times they have something which was more authentic actually, because the signature can be imitated. A seal, it is very difficult to imitate, because every seal is unique. Okay, so the, Ibn Mas'ud, he's giving a parable. This is obviously it's not a physical seal, but he's giving a parable. Is that if you want to see the last will and testament that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam left, in other words, the revelation of Islam, in other words, the summary of our religion, if you want to see this. And he gave the example, it's as if it's the last will upon which is the Prophet's seal. Then he said he should read these verses. قُلْ تَعَالَوْ أَتْلُ مَا حَرَّمَ رَبُّكُمْ عَلَيْكُمْ Is that, say, come, I will recite to you that which your Lord has forbidden upon you, that you worship none, accept him, and you don't commit uh, shirk with him. So once again, this, this, these verses, uh, or this hadith, is showing you the importance of, uh, of these verses. Now, the last hadith. In the chapter. It is narrated that Mu'adh ibn Jabal, رضي الله عنه, said, I was, I, was, I was riding behind the Prophet ﷺ on a donkey, and he said to me, O oh Mu'adh, do you know what is the right of Allah on his slaves, and what is the right of the slaves upon Allah? I responded, Allah and his messenger know best. He continued, the right of Allah upon his slaves is to worship him alone and never to associate anything with him. The right of the slaves upon him is not to punish any person who does not associate anything with him. I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, may I not give the glad tidings to the people? He replied, No, do not inform them lest they rely on this promise and lapse in their service to him. The above hadith is mentioned in the two sahihs. Okay, in this hadith, which is uh, muttafaq ali, muttafaq ali means reported by Bukhari and Muslim. And inshallah we're going to have a class on the sciences of hadith. You will uh, learn that when a hadith is reported by Bukhari and Muslim, it is the most authentic thing after the Quran. After the Quran, the most authentic object or, 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 or text that we can obtain is a hadith that is reported both by Bukhari and Muslim. And this hadith is one of them. Um, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, the famous companion, the scholar of this ummah. The Prophet Muhammad said, when the scholars are resurrected on the day of judgment, Mu'adh ibn Jabal will be ahead of them by a footstep. In other words, he's going to be the leader of the ulama, the leader of the scholars. That's how knowledgeable Mu'adh ibn Jabal is. Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, that uh, I was riding behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a donkey. Now the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he passed away, he was the leader of Arabia of his time. No disputes about that. No competition from any other source, any other tribe. He had at his, at his disposal the wealth of the entire Arabian Peninsula of his time. Money of Caesar. The money of Caesar and, and uh, Khusro and uh, uh, what you call it. The gold of Caesar. All of this was in the hands of the Muslims. All of the wealth of Syria, all of the trade, trading caravans that were going forth, the Prophet ﷺ had full control over that. Despite this fact, because of his humbleness and his modesty, we find that he was still riding on a donkey. And this shows you something about a Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, when he could have chosen the most grand of horses, not just a horse, a chariot, in front of which were 8 or 10 or 12 horses, like the Roman emperors and the Persian princes would do. But no, he is riding upon a donkey. And this shows you the humbleness that the Prophet Muhammad had. Not only that, not only that, but this donkey is being shared by two people. Subhanallah. Yani, if the Prophet wanted, he could have had a horse for himself and a horse for Mu'adh. But no, he has a donkey for himself and he has Mu'adh riding on his back too. And not only that, but the other princes and kings, they would not allow another person to ride on the same animal as them. This is a type of, uh, why would I share my animal with you? But look at the Prophet Muhammad that he has a companion behind him, sitting, sitting right behind him, which means he has to be holding on to him, you know, just like a person has to hold on to someone. Look at the humbleness and the humility that our Prophet Muhammad had. That arrogance or richness, none of this existed in his life. He was a simple man, and he, in this, he showed us an example of how, to be, of how we also should be living in this life. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he was riding uh, with the Prophet wasallam on a donkey. Okay? And uh, other narrations of the hadith, they add that the Prophet said, Ya Mu'adh, O Mu'adh, I love you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now imagine the consciousness of Mu'adh now, that this is the messenger of Allah telling him that he loves him for the sake of Allah. So Mu'adh, he started crying when he heard this. And then the Prophet went on and he said, Ya Mu'adh, O Mu'adh, do you know 
the right that Allah has upon His servant. Do you know the right that Allah has upon His servant? What rights do we owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is the concept? Or what is the, the, the thing that we owe to Allah? What is the right that, you ha- that we have that Allah has upon us? So, so Mu'ad said, Allah and His Messenger know best. And this is the proper way to answer when you don't know. When you don't know something, don't invent a, a, a response. Don't pretend that you know the response. No. Mu'ad and Jabal, he responded, Allah and His Messenger know best. I don't know. Allah and His Messenger know best. He was not arrogant to admit that he did not know. And this is a, a, a lesson for us too, that when we are asked something about this religion of Islam, and if we give a response that is false, we give a lie, then we should realize that a great punishment of Allah is upon us. And instead, we should get ourselves out of this situation, follow the example of Mu'adh, and say, Allah and His Messenger know best. Or you will respond, I don't know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. We should not be arrogant and forget our humility or humbleness in the process. So the Prophet ﷺ responded when Mu'adh said this. He said, the right that Allah has upon His servants. In other words, the right that is obligatory upon us to give to Allah. What is it? So the Prophet ﷺ said, the right that Allah has upon His servant is that they worship Him without associating partners with Him, without giving that worship to any other object or deity, without committing shirk. And then he said, what is the right that we have upon Allah? Can we even have a right upon Allah? No, but out of Allah's mercy, out of Allah's mercy, it is as if He is giving a type of transaction that if you do this, I'll do this for you. Even though we cannot have any rights upon Allah. Allah is our creator. He has given us everything that we have. Our very lives have been given to us by Him. How can we have any rights upon Allah? We don't have any rights upon Allah, but out of Allah's mercy, out of Allah's blessings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, it is as if He is giving us a type of transaction, a type of deal. Is that if you do this, which is my right, I will give you this and I'll call it your right. Okay, you understand where I'm coming from? Inshallah. Tayyib. So Allah subhanahu uh, or the Prophet said, Do you know the right that we have upon Allah? So Mu'adh bin Jabal said, Allah and His Messenger know best. So the Prophet said that the right that Allah has, or the right that we have upon Allah, is that Allah does not punish us if we do this. Allah does not punish us if we fulfill the rights that Allah has upon us. Which is what? Tawheed. In other words, if we practice and fulfill Tawheed, if we implement Tawheed in our lives, then the result of that, or the, or the, the, um, the transaction will result in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish us. So the rights that we're going to have upon Allah, and like I said, we cannot really have a right upon Allah, but in His mercy Allah has called it the right that we have upon Him. Okay? That the right that we're going to have upon Allah is that Allah will not punish any person. Allah will not punish any person who does this. In other words, who fulfills Tawheed. So the Prophet ﷺ said, or Mu'ad said, should I not inform the people of this? Should I not inform the people of this good thing? So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, don't inform them, or else they might become lax, they might become lazy in their worship of Allah. They might rely upon this. Okay? In other words, uh, even though this fact is true and it exists, right? if we go and tell the Muslims that are not praying, the Muslims that are evil, they are sinning, right? If we go tell them this, shaitan is going to come and deceive them. Shaitan is going to come and deceive them and say, well, I'm not committing shirk, so I'm not going to be punished. No, this is not what is meant by this hadith. This is why the Prophet ﷺ told Mu'adh not to tell the people. And Mu'adh didn't tell them until he felt that the time would be right and, and the people would understand it, that they would not be confused. Likewise, when we hear this hadith, right, we shouldn't go and tell it to the non-practicing Muslims. No, because if they're not even praying, if they're committing sins left and right, we should warn them to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should warn them that their severe punishment might be upon them. Once they become more knowledgeable, once they understand the rights that Allah has, then we can inform them of these types of hadith. And this is not hiding knowledge, no. This is being wise with knowledge. That we tell it to the people who will understand it properly. We don't call this hiding knowledge, no. We call this telling knowledge to people who will understand it properly and not misinterpret it. Okay? Likewise, if, for example, if you're giving da'wah to non-Muslims, okay? you're standing in front of, for example, a university audience uh, of non-Muslims or something, okay? you don't just start off with, uh, well, Islam allows slavery, Islam allows a man to have four wives, Islam allows jihad. You don't start off like this. Yes, Islam does allow these type of things, but it's called wisdom. You're not hiding knowledge from them, but you are wise in what you present to, your, to the people. Likewise, when a, when a Muslim just converts, okay? you should have some, something called wisdom with him. Okay? You should have wisdom with him. Don't just overburden him. Don't just tell him things that he might drive him away. No. You tell him things that he understands. This is not hiding knowledge again. But this is taking into account the level of Islam that he has. Okay, is that clear? This hadith, don't use it to say that there is a hidden Islam and there is an apparent Islam. No. This, this is, there is no such thing as a hidden Islam. This hadith, after all, is reported in Bukhari and Muslim. Mu'adh al-Jamal did not hide it. He didn't die, you know, till his grave hiding the hadith. 
or else we wouldn't have it. He did tell it, but he told it to the people who would understand it. He told it to the people who would not misinterpret it. Now the point is, getting back to the whole point of the hadith, is that in this hadith, which is the most explicit hadith concerning the rights that Allah has upon us, in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ only mentioned one thing. And that is that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without committing shirk, without associating partners with Him. Which is what? Tawheed. So once again, this chapter here, and this is the last hadith of the chapter, this chapter here, in general, it is a type of introduction to the next five chapters. And to the whole book. Okay? And that the, the, the author is trying to give us the importance of this concept. Now what do we learn in this chapter? We learn that the purpose of creation the purpose that we are sitting here right now, the purpose that we're breathing right now, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the purpose of creation. So anything that takes us away from this purpose of creation has indeed misled us a very severe misleading. Anything that misguides us away, there can be no misguidance greater than this. The very purpose of creation, if we turn our purpose of creation into worshipping other than Allah, what greater loss and what greater sin and what greater crime can that be? Okay? We also learned that all of the messengers were sent with the same message. All of the prophets were sent with the same theme, that of Tawheed. From Adam, Musa, Isa, Ibrahim, Nuh, every prophet you mention, Dawood, Ismail, every prophet you mention, he had the same theme, the same concept in mind, that of Tawheed. La ilaha illallah. So this again shows you the importance of this concept. Is that even though other aspects might have changed, how we worship Allah in the sense, your prayers, not every nation had five prayers. Not every nation had the same dietary laws. Not every nation had the same laws of Hajj. No, these things would change. But there was one never-changing concept. And that is the concept of Tawheed. So once again, this shows you the importance of Tawheed. We also sh- uh, learned that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks of Tawheed in the Quran, He talks of it using affirmation and negation in the same time. And we described how this was the peak of eloquence. Is that if you affirm something, you don't necessarily deny other things. If you deny one thing, you don't necessarily affirm other things. Okay? Only when you take both into account. La ilaha illallah. There is no God except Allah. So you have eliminated all concepts of God. All deities. All false concepts of worship. And you have affirmed this concept only for one deity. Only for one being. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the height of eloquence. We also learned that every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes Islam in a number of verses, He starts off with one concept, that of Tawheed. So once again, this shows you the importance of Tawheed. And we also learned in this hadith of Mu'ad that this is the right that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon us. The one right, the main right that Allah has upon us is the right that we worship Him without associating partners with Him. Now the next five chapters, we're going to talk about again the importance of Tawheed, but each time from a different perspective. This was like a general importance of Tawheed. Now the next five chapters, we're going to talk about various perspective, various ways of looking at Tawheed and emphasizing again again and again and again and again how important Tawheed is. Okay, uh, the brother has a good question that uh, in the in the verses of Surah Al-An'am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives ten commandments and prohibitions. Now, where is the right that the Prophet ﷺ has? It's apparently not mentioned in these verses. We have to take into account that uh, a person cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless he acknowledges the Prophet of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu No person can worship Allah except through the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu How else is a person going to know who Allah is? How else is he going to know what are the names and attributes of Allah? How else is he going to know what Allah commanded him and prohibited, prohibited him from doing? So we say then that La ilaha illallah automatically implies Muhammad Rasulullah. How can you say La ilaha illallah? Who taught you this? It's found in the Quran and the Sunnah. And who brought the Quran and the Sunnah? Who is the one who, whom Allah revealed the Quran to? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So we say then that this question or this point, the Prophet of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the rights that the Prophet had, this is implied, automatically implied. In the verse. And it's obviously mentioned explicitly in other verses and other hadith, right? Clearly, explicitly. Like the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that uh, I swear by him in whose hands is my soul, there is not a single Jew or a Christian that hears about me, meaning the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and dies without believing in me, except that he will be of the fire of hell. Okay? So there are many explicit Quranic ayat and a hadith concerning the fact that we have to believe in the Prophet and the rights of the Prophet and all of these aspects. However, in these particular verses, we say that it is implied. For how else, for example, in the verse, قُلْ تَعَالُوا Tell them. Well, who is Allah telling them to tell them? He is telling the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam to tell them. Okay? So it is implied in these verses. It is implicit and is not necessarily explicit in these verses. Now, 
if Islam means submission and not peace, then what does Muslim mean? Muslim means one who submits himself. Okay? Muslim, a Muslim is one who has submitted himself, in other words, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when I say Islam does not mean peace, like I said, I, I want to clarify this. Islam doesn't mean, linguistically, Islam does not mean peace. Linguistically. In other words, from a language perspective, Islam does not mean peace. Islam means submission. Okay? However, obviously, Islam... If a person practices Islam in the proper way, this will bring about peace in this life and in the hereafter. Okay? But it does not mean peace linguistically. Likewise, a Muslim is not one who is peaceful. No. A mu- even though he is peaceful, right? But a Muslim does not mean one who is peaceful. You see what I'm trying to say? Linguistically, a Muslim doesn't mean a peaceful person. Inshallah, a Muslim is a peaceful person. You know, Like the Prophet said, the Muslim is one whom other Muslims are, are safe from. Okay, from his tongue and from his hands. In other words, no Muslim is going to cause harm to another Muslim. But the point is, linguistically, a Muslim is one who submits himself to Allah. In other words, submits himself to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 